see. <clears throat> the math, the modeling, the way it's uh, formulated is almost a copy as the simple setting with the additional thing that now we don't have only one x, we could have potentially p x's, p being three in our uh, example here, right? And then the model reads like this. Instead of just one x, we have a number of x's uh, that we relate linearly and additively. It's a model, not necessarily the true model, the true relationship, but it's the linear model for the relation between one y and a number of x's. Still, we have the same statistical assumptions that the extent to which this model is not the true uh, model in a way or not predicts each individual day number exactly. The deviation, the residual from this linear model is assumed to follow a normal distribution. So the weight days are not predicted by this plane, actually. It's a hyperplane now, mathematically, if you want. Um, in, in, with two x's, you, we can depict, it's done in the E notes, I didn't bring the plot. You can depict the hyperplane in, because that's a 3D plot, and y is a function of two, but if I have three, like here, it's difficult to depict, right? We are limited uh, in our brains. Maybe the world is also limited. We assume normality, and we assume, as last time, that the size of this variability, the size of the residuals from the model is the same no matter where in the x space that I'm trying to predict y, right? It's the same deviances all over. It's a non-trivial assumption that we have to check. There are many real life applications where these assumptions might not hold, actually. I'm saying, telling that to you. So, these are actually assumptions. The way we estimate the model is by least squares prediction or least squares estimates, just like last time. So the approach is the same. This is, in a way, this is just a slide putting some words and some uh, symbols uh, in, the f in our faces. We talk about the predicted values of y when we plug in the computed estimates. Right? We, and I'm going to tell you how to compute these estimates. When we have computed the estimates in a multiple regression, we can do predictions. We can just plug in an x, and then we have the position of the hyperplane that's a predicted y. Right? Uh, just like last time we, when we could look at a point on the line, now we can look at a point on the, on the plane. There is conceptually no difference. It's just the, uh, the d d dimension of it that has changed. Right? Um, so, the terminology and the notation is the same in the sense that we have the observation, we can predict it by the model, and we have a residual, and the names are all the same as last time. Why I, why I had a residual. It goes the same, exactly the same way. And then, of course, the, resi the residual is the difference between the observed values and the model or the predicted value. Right. Here it comes at least the statement, because now we, we, are not, we, are, we are skipping a lot of the math now, even more of the math than we might previously. Um, but I'm at least sharing with you that we could look also, when we have multiple x's, we could make the same um, strategy and use the same criterion as last time, where we decided that it's a good criterion to try to minimize the squared differences between the model and the observations, right? So we minimize the vertical differences between the y's and the plane now, like we minimized between the y's and the line last time. And mathematically, it's expressed like this. We minimize the difference. And in this one, we have all the betas, the unknown betas, in a way, that we should solve. We should find a set of betas beta naught, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, up to beta p. Let's work with the example. 
zero, one, two, three. There are four beaters to find now. Intercept and beta one, two, three. Four of them should be found and computed based on the data. And then having computed that, we can use this minimized residuals to compute the average residual, sort of, right? And with the little extension that we do not divide by n minus 1, not by n minus 2, but we divide by n minus the number of betas that we estimate. 3 plus 1, right? That's a p plus 1. 4 in, in our example. How can we take this principle into actually computing the betas? Yeah, that's the proof of the least squares uh, principle that I do not force you to know the details of. It's not part of the syllabus. However, for those of you who are able to do a bit of math and know a little bit of linear algebra, it's not rocket science. So by all means, go look at the proof and the uh, uh, section of the e-notes where this is shared with you. It's not part of the syllabus, but it's nice to know if you have some math interest, right? Actually, the principle is the same. Remember last time? The way we optimized or minimized the least squares criterion was, that's a mathematical exercise, we find the de de derivatives and we solve, I mean, we put the derivatives equal to zero. This is second year. On, if, for one-dimensional approach, this is first year, second year, high school uh, stuff, right? That we can optimize or minimize the function by f doing the derivative, putting it to zero, and solving to find the optimal point, whether it's an optimum or minimum, right? Now, what we did last time was to do it in two dimensions for the beta naught and beta one. Today, we do it in general dimensions, but it's the same exercise. If we take this expression, now I just give it to you, almost, if there are two x's, I can take the derivative with respect to beta naught, I can take the derivative with respect to beta one, I can take the derivative with respect to beta two, it will give me three linear equations with three unknowns. I can solve three linear equations with three unknowns. I could also put it into matrix language, not syllabus, there is a section, such that this actually would tell me this one that would give that the beta hat would be the inverse of this one times what is on, I mean, this here is actually this vector, and this expression here is given by this matrix by vector multiplication, that there is a closed form solution expression for the betas in an MLR. It's not syllabus. I don't, I'm not going to ask you to do these computations manually. But I would like to spend the three minutes to tell you that. And of course, in a way, if you would see what this expression would tell you in with only one x, of course, it tells you exactly the explicit formulas that you had for the slope and the intercept last time. right? So this is the more general model framework that works. It's not rocket science, it's the same ideas that you were taught last time, just put into higher dimensions, right? But don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to do all this matrix vector. For some of you, it's probably very challenging. For others, uh, maybe less so, depending on who we are. But since this is a course for everyone, I'm not going to enforce this on you. Right? That's as far as I would take it.